Welcome to this talk, Collabora and Valve, what we're doing and why we're doing it. First, a little bit about the companies involved. Uh, you obviously don't need to be told who Valve are, they're kind of a big deal and a pretty major company, but uh, who are we? Well, Collabora are an open source software consultancy. Um, you know, that may or may not tell you what sort of things we do, depending on how much you know about the field. So what sort of things do we do? Well, that depends on who's asking. Uh, seriously, it actually does depend on who's asking because we cover a wide range of areas. Uh, we've done work in graphics, graphics drivers, um, putting stuff on screen, Western, um, multimedia, web engines. We do customization work for people if they need something fixed up to work just right for them and ideally upstream changes as well if the upstream project is interested. Uh, similarly, bug fixes in a project that they might be using, uh, we, we work on that and upstream the fixes later. Um, we've done uh, integrated platforms for people, so basically if someone needs a custom platform for uh, all of their products that uh, that is going to be used uh, by them, then, then we do that and they're building integration systems and reproducible builds. So a wide range of areas come by what we do. So, um, and hopefully you'll see that in the list of work that we do for Valve, which we will go to next since that's what you're really here for. So, what's first on our list? Let's start with this. Intercepting syscalls. Um, so, what's this all about? So, um, if you know what a syscall is, it's when uh, the uh, user space makes a call into the kernel for a specific piece of functionality, a system call. Now, normally this sort of thing is mediated via the uh, li a library or a runtime, such as uh, your C library, um, uh, but you can make direct syscalls um, if you know the number of the syscall you want to make and what kind of parameters it needs. So why is this important? Well, uh, when you've got something like a game, uh, you know, for example, it's obviously going to be important to someone like Valve or an application, uh, which makes a syscall, if it goes via a library, it can be intercepted uh, by an emulator or a non-emulator, depending on your point of view, uh, such as Wine or Proton. And uh, so we can run uh, these things on a non-native system, um, such as uh, Linux, um, through an emulator, if we can intercept syscalls to do uh, that part of the emulation. Now, lately, uh, more and more applications have been bypassing the libraries, the DLLs uh, in the Windows world, which are used, uh, which provide the wrappers for these syscalls. Sometimes a syscall might not even have a wrapper. Uh, this is problematic because, of course, if we don't intercept a syscall, then we've just made an unknown, strange, almost certainly bad request to the Linux kernel. Um, and um, frankly, it's going to be chaos. Cats and dogs living together, uh, the end of the world, um, and more importantly, your game's not going to work. So we need to do something about that, and because it's a game uh, where this matters more than usual, uh, we need to do it efficiently and quickly. There needs to be as little overhead as possible. So what can you do? Um, a few approaches were tried. Um, one of the original approaches was to use SE Linux to trap the calls, uh, effectively make them forbidden and then react to them, to redirect them. Um, unfortunately, that's a bit... Um, there's a bit of a hammer to crack a nut situation. Um, it works, but it's not fast. There's a lot of overhead um, and it's really far from ideal. Um, another approach was to use setcomp in a sort of similar way. Um, again, a bit of pushback from that from the community. It's not ideal. It's not really the right shape of tool for the job. And using something that should be for security, for non-security uses is generally frowned upon because you increase your attack surface area by doing unexpected things. Um, you might actually introduce a vulnerability when the whole purpose of it is to prevent vulnerabilities or ameliorate them. So um, what, uh, what did we end up doing? So uh, the, the thing that we ended up going with was a, uh, a personality-based mechanism, which by um, extending a little bit of uh, infrastructure in the kernel allows us to track calls from particular addresses and particular parts of an application, uh, which means that we can very easily uh, enable and disable this trapping, and we can trap just the syscalls that we are interested in 
and let the rest go through, which is great because that is really what you want to do. You're only interested in trapping a few of the syscalls. Uh, this approach has the additional advantage that we don't need to change uh, or monkey patch the, the game binaries or the game libraries at all, because um, obviously um, that's tricky because that can often fall foul of anti-cheat mechanisms who have no way of distinguishing between you doing something for the purpose of emulation and someone intercepting syscalls to try and beat an anti-cheat mechanism. So um, that's what we ended up going with. I think that one's wending its way into the kernel. I don't think it's been accepted yet, but the patches have been going back and forth on the list. And hopefully that will be landing soon to bring us a better Wine and Proton gaming experience. On to the next item, case and sensitive file systems. So, um, you know, uh, obviously this is a fairly easy one to understand. Um, in, on in the Windows world, where most games come from these, day, uh, these days, uh, file systems are case insensitive. You don't have to care what cases, uh, patterns you use when accessing files. It all works um, regardless of what you've uh, used. Uh, this is very much not the case in the uh, Unixy Linuxy world. Uh, we expect a change in case to mean a different file. Uh, now. While a lot of the hard work of porting to multiple platforms is taken care of by things such as Unity, um, you've still got a problem in the way that they are used. Uh, so one thing that we tend to see a lot is that game developers or application developers often have quite a haphazard approach to the capitalization patterns they use. They'll request a file with an initial capital, or if a different developer was part of doing that part of the code, maybe all caps, or possibly they'll be um, intercapped in a different way um, because that's not necessarily obvious and this can cause huge problems because random assets in the game can suddenly appear to not be there and not be found um, and that makes porting much more painful than it needs to be and of course it's quite hard to tell someone who's used to a case following file system no no you actually have to be consistent all the time from their point of view, quite reasonably, it's just an onerous and unreasonable request that they're not going to do anything about. So we have to solve the problem if we want porting to be easy. So how do we do this? Uh, the approach that we've gone with is to uh, allow case folding support in the EXT family of file systems. Um, and uh, I believe we're also looking at, once that work has landed and been accepted, to extending that work to other file systems. Uh, you might say that that should go in the VFS layer, and that's a reasonable thing to say, and one of the things that we will look at once we've gotten to the point of the mechanisms and the work being accepted is maybe getting that into the VFS layer. Um, when I say we, um, I'm not actually doing the work. Um, it's one of my colleagues, um, so uh, we'll see where that goes. I mean, I mean, hopefully, we're getting pretty close, I think. Again, this is something that should has either been merged or should be merged to the kernel soon, I hope, once uh, everything's accepted. Uh, one particular thing that uh, we had to work on quite a lot um, that was uh, added quite a bit of complexity to the, the whole process was local and Unicode support. Uh, case folding is a lot easier when you just have ASCII to consider, but when you consider locales where cases, uh, some characters might not be considered characters that have a case in some, might be considered to have cases in others, all that good stuff um, has gone into our implementation. So uh, hopefully it will be coming to a ported game near you um, someday very soon now. Next up, runtimes and keeping them up to date. So um, I'll not going to waste too much of your time explaining something that you probably know, but what is a runtime? Um, probably best to think of it as a promise that's made to an application or game developer about um, everything that's going to be available to the game when it runs in terms of library versions, uh, software, um, all, all the little bits of infrastructure that go around it that you would normally expect to come from your distribution and your operating system. Um, the idea with a runtime is that the application or game developer targets a particular runtime at a particular version and then doesn't worry too much about the actual version or distribution of the operating system that they'll be running on. Um, 
this is great from their point of view. Uh, from the maintainer's point of view, it doesn't actually change the problem. Um, the runtime still needs to be maintained. Now, what do I mean by maintained? Well, um, security fixes are a thing. Um, just because you're not fixing the libraries uh, provided by your distribution, um, you still need to fix the ones provided by your runtime. You know, if there's a security breach, if there's a flaw, you need to fix it. It needs to be rolled out. All of those runtimes need to be updated. Um, protocol changes, you know, the outside world changes. There's a limit to how much we can isolate a game. If, if it needs to talk to a server, if it needs to talk to external services, um, particularly multiplayer games, um, there might be network issues, um, so something needs to be done about that, the library that it's using. All that stuff needs to be looked at. It might not be a security fix, but it might still stop working. Um, TLS certificates, root certificates might would be an example of that. That stuff needs to be in the runtime and needs to be kept up to date. And of course, there is random monkey patching of the runtime for legacy reasons. Something might be broken, something might have changed in an unpredictable way. We've had a flag day in the world, which means that everything needs to fit get its house in order to keep on working. Um, that still needs to happen, and it needs to happen for each runtime that is still supported. And since the point of a runtime is that it should stay supported for a really long time, so that a game that you bought five, ten years ago still works, you still need to do that. So this is one of the another one of the things we do. Um, we do maintenance on the runtimes that Steam uses, and we are working on uh, streamlining the process of releasing new runtimes and getting security fixes into them so that we can maintain a quickly iterating bunch of runtimes that get regular updates so games aren't chained to old versions of libraries, but they also stay working um, with a particular runtime. The idea is that maybe at times a game developer, if they care, might retarget their game at a newer runtime that's provided and we'd still be maintaining that and that would work. Um, or if not, it's an old game, it's um, end of life for development, it would still go on working because the runtime that it was tar targeting uh, was still getting its security fixes and other random repairs that it needed to keep working. And next, we come to containerization. This is kind of related to the previous item, runtimes. Um, uh, it's all about even more isolation of the game or application from the system around it. Uh, one of the fundamental building blocks is uh, things like namespaces, um, so user ID namespaces, network namespaces, file system namespaces, where the idea is you just carve off little chunks of the system uh, to uh, limit what's visible to an application or game, um, which allows you to restrict what it can see um, down to the bits that it needs to to work. Uh, the idea of this is partly for security reasons, um, so that if there's a flaw, there's a limit um, or a vulnerability, there's a limit to what the game or application can do. And it's partly stability. The less of the system, the more restricted point of view that a game or application has, the fewer things can actually cause it to stop working. If it literally can never see them, then those things can't we hope, stop it from working if they change in some way. Um, so that's what containerization is about. I talked a little about namespaces. One of the big deals right now is Flatpak, um, and Bubble Wrap is the technology that it's based on. Flatpak provides a lot of the infrastructure and work around it. Bubble Wrap is the sort of lower level thing um, that, that it's built on. And we're doing a fair amount of work to get uh, Steam games running under those things. Um, one of our goals is that in addition to our own containerization work, which is also built around bubble wrap um, and is particularly targeted at uh, Steam and Valve, we also want to be able to make um, all of it work under Flatpak. There are some challenges to this um, because there are things that Steam or the way that Steam launches games expect to do that it didn't quite fit into the Flatpak uh, worldview, but we're coordinating between um, the uh, Flatpak teams and um, and uh, Valve, and trying to get to a point where both things play nicely with one another, you know, because in it, well, it would be really great if Flatpak were a mechanism where we could provide Steam games, um, and they would hopefully just work. 
Um, so uh, one of the things there that's quite important and uh, we are sinking quite a lot of time into is device access, you know, raw or faked um, game libraries and game frameworks or games directly themselves, if they don't use a framework, um, are quite keen on quite a lot of low-level access to things like controllers um, and the devices that represent them in the operating system. Um, it's understandable, they often have fairly specialized needs, they're not typical applications, um, they might, quite a few of them, are precious and unique snowflakes in what they do, and for good reason. So um, we have to look at that and we have to figure out how do we punch holes into the containerization solution, you know, whether it's Flatpak or uh, Pressure Vessel, the thing that we're working on, or something a bit more bespoke with Bubble Wrap? You know, how do we make it work? And um, do we expose a raw device, or do we fake up a raw device? You know, and if we do that, how much heavy lifting are we doing with sort of emulation um, to make it look like they've actually got the raw device? Um, you know, and then we have to also consider security. Are we actually just, you know, contradicting the main purpose of the containers, or well, the two main purposes, the stability and the security, by punching these holes? We have to be quite careful when we propose these things. Um, so that is uh, the, the next big area, which is related to the, the, the runtimes that we've talked about, because of course, typically your container would have a runtime parachuted into it to be made available to the application that's running. Right, diving a little deeper into the whole containerization runtime um, security uh, rabbit hole, we find segregated dynamic linking. Um, now this one's one of uh, my personal projects uh, in that I'm one of the people who does quite a lot of the work on it. Um, so uh, you probably haven't come across the phrase before, what does it even mean? Uh, well, uh, normally when you link to a library, um, you get symbols from that library, but the library pulls in its own dependencies as well. Um, and you see the symbols from those dependencies. Um, if a library depends on something that you've already pulled in, another library, a third library that you've already pulled in, it'll just use that instead, um, which is all well and good and is mostly what you want and is efficient and is generally the right thing to do. Unfortunately, sometimes, um, particularly when you have long-lived applications or games that have been knocking around for a really long time, they'll depend on a version of a library that's not compatible with a version that something else is using. Uh, so, for example, a Mesa graphics driver might rely on a C standard library that's different to the one that a game um, it relies on. Uh, you can't have two of those in the same link chain, um, at least not currently. Um, you're going to have a really bad day if that happens. Um, even if you could make it happen, it would just be messy, uh, painful, and not work very well. Um, so at least until segregated dynamic linking comes along. So the idea with this is that you can load a library and just sort of draw a little dotted line around its symbols and you'll only see the symbols from that library itself. Um, you won't see the symbols from any of its dependencies. They'll be loaded into a little separate namespace. Um, and uh, likewise, the library won't see any symbols from your dependencies. Um, it gets its own little set. Um, now, uh, this isn't a security mechanism. There is no hard enforced um, barrier uh, between the, these, these namespaces. Uh, it's built on DLM Open, which is a new-ish call provided by glibc, which does um, the low-level work. Uh, and on top of that, we've done a bunch of work to mainly to make it streamlined and uh, seamless for the user. I, the basic mechanism already works, but you have to do a lot of juggling. Um, and it turns out there are a couple of things that have to be shared and have to be compatible, uh, one of them being the C library itself. Uh, you can, it turns out, have more than one copy of the C library um, with this mechanism in link chain, but it can get a little hairy, especially if um, one glibc tries to free memory allocated by another, or if threading is involved, the glibcs, let's just say they don't get on and they do not play nicely with one another. So we've had to do a few things to make that seamless so that the libraries that should be the same for all of the namespaces, there's only one copy of, 
and then the rest of the isolation works uh, without any code changes and without any uh, work by the game um, writer or the application developer or all, all that work and it, not a lot once this once this tooling is added um, there's a tiny little bit that generates a stub library to allow the namespace segregation to happen and that's automated so it should be coming to uh, hopefully um, I'm hoping to get it into the next glibc release or possibly the one after that and then hopefully it will be coming to a press pressure vessel and possibly a flat pack if they're interested in it um, implementation uh, shortly after that and uh, yep yeah, that's it uh, so I'll be happy to answer lots of questions about this one because this is the bit of work that I personally know best and now a bit of change of pace uh, the next item open XR um, so uh, VR and AR so hot right now so uh, open XR is an implementation which seeks to provide things like both the low-level drivers, uh, drivers and the high-level user space API that uh, applications uh, or games um, or what have you will use to provide uh, VR and AR um, to, to users. And uh, one of the things that OpenXR is under the Kronos umbrella, the, uh, uh, the Vulcan people, and uh, the idea is to provide a uniform, unified set so uh, in much this, uh, hopefully in more, um, a better way than the graphics um, libraries currently do, because we've still got the split between, we've got the Mesa Vulcan uh, DirectX uh, splits. Um, the goal is that everyone will be able to use OpenXR. Um, it will have the same shape from the driver's point of view and from the uh, applications or games point of view. Uh, the implementations might differ, but uh, we're hoping that, and uh, Kronos are hoping that, this will make it much easier for OpenXR to be used by anyone who wants to do VR and AR. And uh, one of the things that we're working on is making it good enough, so you may be aware that Valve have their uh, Valve VR. That was started before OpenXR came along. Um, one of our goals is to see if we can get OpenXR to the point where uh, Valve VR can hop from one backend set of implementations to this because the ultimate goal is that VR and AR should work um, out of the box without the users having to know which hardware is compatible with which framework. Um, you should be able to buy it, plug it in, be ready to go, that's it. Um, and um, we and Valve believe that that's in everyone's interests, you know, for this thing to take off properly. Um, because right now it's a bit like the, the old days, right at the beginning when 3D cards were a thing, uh, a new thing, uh, and you just had to know so much about what was compatible with what to get them up and running. Um, if you don't like that, I think it stops take up, it stops the spread of VR and AR. So we're hoping to get that done so that uh, we can uh, explore these brave new virtual worlds. And finally, the last item on my list, um, it's got a bit of a clunky name because I don't really have um, a well-known name to describe it by, but uh, Atomic Updates and AB Booting. Well, so what do I mean by that, um, I hear you ask. Uh, so the whole idea of Atomic Updates is that you have quick, foolproof updates. Uh, you get a definite result, you know whether the update of your operating system your distribution, whatever you want to call it, uh, worked or didn't. Um, and the idea of AB booting is that you have two copies of the system and you hop from one to the other uh, as you go uh, through your updates. So you may start on A, you'll update B, um, check that it works. Did it work? Great. We'll start booting B from now on. Next time we update, we'll end up on an updated version of the A copy. Um, uh, if it didn't, we can fall back to the last one we had, which is great because especially if you're doing things like um, a game console like piece of kit um, or uh, you, uh, a very specialized operating system where you don't want to put um, a distribution, where you don't want to put in a lot of tools um, necessarily. So maybe the users aren't expected to be as technically capable and really we shouldn't expect them to be. Um, making the whole process much more reliable and also 
Well, one other thing is speeding it up. So uh, if we tack on to this that we have a read-only file system for the bulk of the operating system, it means that when we update, we only need to update blocks uh, at, at the block level, the parts of the file system that have actually changed, uh, which means you can seriously speed up the update. Uh, and since they are read-only and we know they haven't been altered, um, and we do fixed point releases of the operate of the distribution. Um, even if you've skipped a few updates, we can still generate on the server side the list of changes that you need and limit what you need to download. So it's fast, it's reliable, we have a fallback mechanism. Um, these are all great things that we want to provide and we've been working on this um, from the bootloader into uh, all the way up to the operating system update mechanisms themselves um, to provide all of that. Um, you know, it's not quite turnkey yet, but it's getting there um, to the uh, uh, at, at the operating system and distribution level. Uh, now, some of you are going to be thinking, "Oh, well, wait a minute! Doesn't that doesn't that mean I can't hack on the system anymore? Isn't this tremendously unfriendly to the whole open source ethos?" And it's like, well, it would be, but we have provided uh, an easy read write read write mode switch. So um, if you want to mess about with the system, you want to do a bit of development, um, uh, whether you're inside Valve or not, um, if you want to do a bit of um, hacking up and try something new, you can. Um, there is a mechanism to just say, I'd like to switch into read write mode now. Um, you do that, the system becomes writable, you can mess about it with your heart's content. And the great bit part is if you break it utterly, which, you know, let's face it, we've all been known to do, you can always flip back to the previous version uh, and then use that to bounce back into a known good state uh, on the version that you were on. Fantastic. So it should make um, development and hacking and hobby hacking, uh, as well as professional hacking, um, a lot easier for the whole thing. And uh, that's where we're going with the whole atomic updates and AB booting thing. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a big chunk of the work that we've been doing um, for a while, but it's, uh, it's coming along nicely. Uh, and I hope you'll be able to see that real soon. Right, that brings me to the end of the little quick whistle -top stop tour of, of the work that we're doing for Valve. Um, I hope it's been enlightening and interesting. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about any of it. Uh, here's, I've just put in a little recap of the different topics. So uh, to remind you of what we talked about. So um, hit me up with any questions you like about these. Um, hopefully some of my colleagues are going to be here when we do this live because uh, some of these I know a lot less about because I didn't really work on them. Others I know a bit more about and will be happy to talk your ears off about uh, as much as you like. So um, floor is open to questions.